everybody. I'm here today with uh, the composer, conductor, pianist, and teacher, John Levitt. And we're delighted to have him here with us as we, as we uh, explore uh, composers of music that we're going to be performing and learning this year. I've known John for a long time, and the proof is right here. We're both in that picture, and can you recognize us? We're, we're, he looks about the same, I think, but hey, I've known John for about 30 years, and I'm glad to see him here today. Welcome, John. It's nice to see you, Emily. So um, tell us about your, your composing career. Uh, that's, that's how I know you best, from your music. Uh, and how did you be, how did you get into the composing business? What led you to it? And were, were you always composing even as a child? Um, so I actually started writing music in high school and it was, it wasn't an, an intentional thing. It was a, it was for my nerdy friends. Uh, I ran around with a bunch of band, band kids, you know, they all played in the band and I, at the time I didn't play in the band. I played the piano for the choir and I also played in the jazz band. And so we'd hang out and they have their instruments. They say, well, write us something. And so that's kind of how I got started with writing. And um, it was fun. And every once in a while we put something together that was decent enough that we could even do it in church. And um, so that kind of followed me into college a little bit. And uh, then when I finally uh, moved to Wichita and got a, a real job, uh, I started working uh, part-time in church music. And uh, of course, with the church music, we're going to show our age a little bit here. Uh, you know, reading sessions were usually in the summer. And if you wanted to go look at music outside of a reading session, you had to go down to the music store and go through the the racks one piece at a time and I would be looking for music for my choir and sometimes I would find what I was looking for and other times I wouldn't and so I thought okay I'll just write something so I got involved there and then um, the other part of my work I got involved um, working for the ABC affiliate in Wichita uh, straight out of college and um, they had a local uh, talk entertainment program and they hired me to play the piano uh, background music and uh, as the show kind of grew up and became sophisticated my role changed and I ended up uh, doing uh, uh, production they asked me to uh, provide a talent segment on the show every day well you know I was in my 20s and I didn't know very many people, at, but now all of a sudden I was a producer. And so I could, I had an excuse to call, you know, the symphony office or um, the jazz festival or whatever. And so um, it, at a very young age, it put me in touch with the entire music community in Wichita. And so that kind of opened doors for me. I started doing jingle work. So I wrote some jingles for local businesses and that put me in the recording studio and got me involved with a whole nother group of people. And so I kind of had a very eclectic early run at stuff. And um, then after my master's, I started working adjunct uh, teaching at a local college. And that's when the, the choral writing got really serious. Um, I didn't know any better and I was hungry. So I did what I was told. And my boss had this 80 voice choir that I served as the accompanist for. And they did a, a big benefit show in the spring, like eight performances to raise money for scholarships. And so I, he would say, I need you to write me an arrangement of this and this and this and this. And by the time I finished that gig, I was writing full shows. And uh, so that kind of opened, you know, I was writing so much stuff uh, I thought you know I ought to try to publish some of this <laughs> well so yeah uh you 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 wrote a lot for uh what you needed at the time and then it, but then eventually you uh you approached a publisher or a publisher approached you or something happened and all of a sudden we uh we those of us who were in the choral world uh had heard of 
John Levitt, this wunderkind <laughs> over there from Kansas. <laughs> well, Tell us how uh, that happened. So I, um, I, I, I probably knew the, the small church publishing catalogs better uh, because I was consuming that music for, for my church choirs and, and whatnot. And so I started soliciting uh, unsolicited publication. I, I'd sent them unsolicited manuscripts and I, I have lots of rejection letters and I kept them all. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I kept them is because um, they by themselves are a little bit of an education on the process because um, the first rejection letters I got from publishers were basically form letters. And then um, I would get, a, occasionally I get a rejection letter. Well, we like this piece, but we don't like this one. We like this piece because we don't like this one because. Well, now I was getting a little bit of editorial direction. And um, I think my first piece to pop, which was a surprise to me, was a little mini cantata. Uh, and looking back, it, it's a surprise because as you know, cantatas are more expensive to produce than, you know, a single octavo. And uh, so that first piece to pop was kind of my toe in the door. And then I could name drop with other publishers and slowly things began to be published or, uh, around the industry. And uh, then uh, after I had a little bit of a, a foothold uh, then there were a few editors that came uh, calling. So. Well, you, you, you've alluded to writing for church music, but I know you also write for, um, for schools and for uh, pop, uh, pop community groups. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your catalog? It's, it's rather large and varied at this point. And plus, I think you write some music for in, instrumental only, and, and also you do your own orchestrations for certain works. Yeah, so the reason for the, the variety is, you know, I, I worked in the church, I was teaching school, uh, I, as I mentioned at the college position. Uh, and, and again, I didn't, at that age, I didn't know much about copyright. I just did what my boss told me. Well, I later found out some of what we were doing was not correct. And when I found that out, I, I put a stop to it. I said, you know, you really have to get permission uh, to do this. And, um, but um, I, I had written a lot of uh, uh, show charts and pop, pop charts, as well as the sacred music and school music. I tend to, um, in the early part of my career, I was writing for what I had in, in front of me. And you will recall, we both uh, had started children's choirs at roughly the same time. So, you know, I went on this big spurt uh, when I had a children's choir, I wrote a lot of children's music. And so it just, once I kind of got uh, writing for a, a variety like that, it just kind of stuck. So. Well, tell us a little bit about your process. Like how does a, how does a piece uh, come into being? Where do you get your ideas and how, how do you develop them? Well, I'm a big fan of folk music. And um, so uh, I think that's probably ripe for me to get ideas from. I obviously arrange folk music, but I use it as, as a resource too. And, um, but um, I had a, a wonderful teacher uh, back when I was starting to orchestrate things. I didn't really know how to do that very well. And so I thought I'd better get some some training. And when I was doing my master's degree at Wichita State, uh, they had a, a teacher on staff that was a Pulitzer Prize nominee. And he's brilliant. And, and so I studied with him and he basically taught me orchestration. Um, but um, the thing um, I learned from him is when you're stuck, uh, you have to have tools you know, you can't say, well, I'm not inspired today, so I'm not going to work today. That, that doesn't work. And so um, if, if I am not inspired and I, I don't find what I'm looking for in, in folk music, then you go back to the basics. So I've got a little illustration I can share with you if you like. Yeah. 
So I, I, I sometimes say it, it may be as simple as, as this. You start with three notes, play it again and add a note, play it again and add two more notes. Okay, now play that whole phrase again. Add the note, but this time change it. Then play the three notes upside down. Add the note. Repeat. So now you have a melody. If you play the whole thing, it sounds like. So, so uh, what you're saying is improvisation plays a big part of your compositional process. It does, but as you can see, I'm also using a lot of theory. Now, do I think, oh, you know, I'm going to use inversion and all of those tools are intuitive now. But yeah, I, I go back to the tool bag, the theory bag, repetition, sequence, inversion, uh, you know, all of those tools come into play, especially if you get stuck. So, um, do you, uh, what do you say, how do you, how do you work with students of composition, young people who are uh, looking to uh, develop their skills as composers? I, I, I think you do teach some, and, and so uh, how, how does that go, how does that work for you? It, it, it's very fulfilling for me. I actually uh, teach several students via Zoom and um, I actually uh, teach them the way my teacher taught me. Um, I was very fortunate if some, I, I've watched some uh, higher education institutions where the teacher, you know, it's, he's big into electronic music. So all of his students are big into electronic music or whatever. Um, my teacher uh, said, okay, here's your strengths, here's your weaknesses, let's build on your strengths, let's fix your weaknesses. And um, so I try to meet the students where they are and then build on what they do well and then try to build some foundation under the weaknesses. So, and, and I, I like that a lot because you're not, I don't want them to be a clone of me. And uh, my teacher, uh, it was the same thing for him. He didn't want his students to sound like him. Right. And, and so um, I, I know when I started studying with him, um, I was working, you know, most of us work in a diatonic language. And, and uh, he was working in a more advanced language. And he said, okay, diatonic's okay, but we need to extend your language. So you know, it's, it's beyond one, four, five. And uh, so we took a very deep dive into the modes. Well, the modes are wonderful because you can add all sorts of uh, character and spice to the music and it extends the diatonic language quite a lot. Well, um, so um, uh, in the, in terms of, uh, uh, you, you mentioned, um, the uh, working in writing pop and show material. There's a lot of people that do that. How would you say that your arrangements of Broadway and other pop songs are different from maybe what you normally see in the, in the standard uh, pop catalogs? Well, Coralie, um, 
again, it's, it's experience, isn't it? And so back when I was writing those shows for that 80 voice collegiate choir, I, you know, that, that's a symphonic choir. It's not a small ensemble. And so um, he was looking for arrangements that would feature the, the, the rich sonority of a group that large, Debussy sometimes, and, uh, but really cultivating a luscious sound. And, and so I, I, I think I'm sensitive. I, I don't write a lot of Debussy or that kind of thing, but I, I am trying to maximize that, that stand up, beautiful singing uh, uh, sound. Uh, not all of the tune, I, I probably wouldn't pick just any tune to arrange. Um, uh, can I write a, uh, a show choir piece? Yeah, I can. I don't do a lot of that um, because there's more, uh, there's a more, there seems to be uh, an equal emphasis on visual with the singing. Um, it's not saying that you can't choreograph my pieces as well, because I have and do. But um, I think that's probably what makes, makes me a little different. I'm, I'm trying to search for uh, more texturing, more sonority. Um, you know, I just came out with uh, a couple of Disney charts in the last couple of years. And um, in, I, always, I always was taught, um, I remember, maybe this will give you a glimpse what, what sets me apart. I remember uh, writing a tune and I took it into my teacher one day and I was really proud of this and I scored it out and everything. And so I was really eager to play it for him and I played it and, and he shook his head and I was expecting a lot of praise. And, and he said, it's okay. And I go, really? And, and he said, yeah. He goes, um, if you were an alto or a viola player, would you want to sing whole notes all the time? <laughs> <laughs> and th that hadn't occurred to me. And I thought, oh, okay. So then we went about the internalization. You know, it's not just playing a beautiful melody with pretty chords. Everybody wants an interesting part to sing or play. Well, that's a much harder thing to do. And so I, you know, if, if it, like on a Disney chart or um, I've got in the Mary Poppins stuff, I have them singing dooms and looms and, you know, they are singing accompaniment figures, which are fun to sing, but they're adding a lot of resonance and sonority. So I'm always looking for, you know, if they're not singing the melody, they still have to do something supportive and interesting. Right, right, right. Well, um, uh, people always ask me this, and so I'm going to ask you, and it, it's a hard question to answer usually, which is, do, do you have one work that, that um, is most special to you um, or stands out as, a, as your personal favorite of, uh, that you have composed? Um, I, I can't distill it down to one piece. I can, I could name you a small handful of pieces that, <laughs> that were uh, significant and still are. Um, you know, I wrote probably the piece that broke me into the choral music industry was Festival Sanctus. And that piece um, keeps on going. Uh, I mean, I, I'm just kind of astounded in the digital age. There is, I have recordings of this from all over the planet. Um, I can thank my teacher, E. Feely, for part of that because he would take his choirs to South America and overseas. And he, not just me, but he would champion some of his students' music. And so I, it helped uh, to spread the word. That's one piece, um, very different. I wrote a piece for Shawnee Press years ago. Uh, it was a, a, a copyright uh, by Linda Marcus called River in Judea. And I wrote it gospel style and uh, very, very different. Um, you actually got me started on klezmer music years ago. Uh, you uh, pushed a tune, suggested a tune at me called Bashana Haba Ah. And um, it was a lovely tune, but I didn't really know what to do with it. And um, I talked to my teacher on the phone about this and he goes, that's a klezmer piece. You need to do klezmer. And I go, okay, I, I don't know how to do that either. 
So he, he was, by the way, he was a clarinet player. So he, he knew Klezmer very well. And um, the piece did well. And uh, so that kind of got me going on Jewish music. That opened up a whole new realm for me. And uh, that's a fascinating uh, area of folk music as well. Um, and then, you know, I, I can fondly uh, remember when my kids were little and we took them on the road singing. Uh, I remember doing any number of things, but uh, one that sticks out, we I did a little arrangement, the Virgin Mary had a baby boy, uh, a little calypso for my children's choir. And then my kids and I took it on the road. Valerie Mack did some choreography and it was very, very cute and, and fun. And, and uh, so whenever I hear that piece, it conjures up all those memories of when my kids were little, I, I enjoy that. Um, and now at, at this stage in my life, I have uh, uh, two grandchildren and uh, uh, I've continued my tradition. When my children were born, I, I wrote a piece uh, for them and published it. And uh, for my grandson, I did the same. I have to get on the stick and get going with my granddaughter. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, those, those are kind of a okay. handful of pieces that stick right. out for me. And 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 what's on the what's on the agenda next for you, John? Well, uh, we're all crossing our fingers that we're you know starting to come out of the pandemic. Um, uh, I I've been writing. Uh, it's been a productive writing time for me during the pandemic, even though my my group hasn't been able to to do anything. Although we just fired up again uh, this month. So uh, we're back singing in person. We're doing all the protocols. Uh, but um, I, I'm starting to write uh, a, a little more choral music. I'm currently working on a couple of uh, piano books, one on American shape note hymns and a new piano book of uh, uh, Christmas uh, carol arrangements. And then I'm, uh, because I had more time during the pandemic, uh, I had this long-term plan to write a, uh, a show. And, and so I'm writing kind of, it's kind of like a, um, uh, the best description I can give you if you've watched Celtic women, kind of like yes. a Celtic women show. Okay. Uh, so it would be like a small ensemble of uh, wonderful singers with a beautiful orchestra. And, and uh, Well, we'll be looking for that on PBS. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm giving myself plenty of time. Ah, yes, that's right. Uh, to work on well, that, but I, uh, I think I've knocked a half a dozen pieces out. So okay, far. good. Well, uh, if people want to get in touch with you, how's the best way to do that? The best way they can get me is uh, via the website uh, johnlevittmusic.com, and my last name is L E A V I T T. JohnLevittMusic.com. There's a place on the web page to contact me. Well, fantastic. It's, it's been great to talk to you today, John. Did I miss anything? Anything else you want to add? Don't think so. It's great to see you, Emily. Well, uh, thanks everybody for hanging in there and, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll give you some uh, ways to get in touch with John on the video after this. So thanks. Thank you, John. Bye-bye. <laughs>